Welcome again to Profiles on Nantucket Community Television and Channel 18. I'm Charlie Walters. My guest today is Nathaniel Philbrick. He is perhaps best known as the author of In the Heart of the Sea, which in the year 2000 won the National Book Award. Since then, he has written books about the Mayflower and General Custer, as well as a trilogy about the American Revolution. He's also the author of Why Read Moby Dick, as well as two books about Nantucket history, and that list is not even complete. His most recent work, published in September of 2021, is titled Travels with George, and Nat is here to tell us about it. Please welcome my neighbor and my friend, Nat Philbrick. Thanks for coming on the show, Nat. Charlie, great to be with you. Travels with George is, of course, a history book, but it's also a new direction for you. So tell us about the book and tell us about that new direction. Yeah, well, I had finished up uh, the trilogy about the American Revolution, you know, and straight history. And I was at a point where I just needed to do something different. I uh, really wanted, I also was wanted to get out of my office <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually see the country I had been writing about. And uh, uh, Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck is one of my favorite books of all time, where Steinbeck gets in his uh, truck w- equipped with a camper in the back and travels with his dog, uh, Charlie, and, and in search of America. And after finishing up the Revolution uh, series, I was uh, even just even before that, I was on a research, late inning research trip in Providence. Uh, uh, visiting the John Brown house. And this is not John Brown, the abolitionist, but this is John Brown, the the merchant and and actual slave trader who built this magisterial brick home um, and was a huge fan of George Washington's. And in the back of that is this small coach, uh, actually technically a chariot, which according to tradition, he took Washington for a ride uh, in 1790, just a year into his presidency. And I was looking at this going, why was George Washington the newly elected president in Providence? And that's when I learned about the fact that when he became president, our country was already divided. uh, And he realized he needed to do something to unite that country. So he went on a series of road trips to try to create a sense of national unity, which really hadn't existed up until this point. Uh, despite the fact that we uh, had a revolution against the the King of England. And so um, I thought, well, what? My wife, Melissa, had just retired. Uh, we had a new dog named Dora, a, go- a, uh, a Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. And I thought, well, what if the two of us follow George Washington's uh, trip across the country? You know, we're living in a time of uh, political divisions, what if we follow Washington while he was at the very beginning of our history trying to pull us together? Now, what year is this? 17... Uh, 89. 89. He, he is elected president. and inaugurated. Yeah, he, he becomes president. And then for the next two years, uh, he would, uh, whenever Congress would go into recess, he'd hit the road. And it began with a tour of New England. Uh, he would go to Long Island, the western end of Long Island, but the most ambitious a uh, tour of them would be the South. That would take him all the way down to Savannah, uh, inland to Augusta. It would take him three months. I mean, he wasn't traveling in Air Force One. He was in a horse-drawn carriage. So now this was not, or, or was this, was this a continuous trip or was this done in stages? It was done in stages. Okay. And so, um, you know, he, he, had, he was president of the United States. He had, you know, some things he had to do back at, at the office, but, uh, one of the things he decided was at the very beginning of uh, his time as president was that there was this huge danger of him becoming isolated from the people it was his job to lead. And so he floated this idea in his cabinet. What if I go on a tour of New England? And the the consensus was that sounds great, but if you're going to do that, you're going to have to go on a tour of the South. Um, So that was all part of his plan is to, you know, whenever he could fit it in, uh, given the congressional schedule, he would go on these tours. Now, uh, if you took the different legs of the, of the trip and combine them all, what, what time frame are we talking about? What, how long did it take? If you added up all the legs of the trip, how long did it take? Yeah, well, it would it would have it would have taken uh, more than two months, and uh, if you put them all together, you know, more than more than twenty five hundred miles, 
And, you know, on his New England tour alone, uh, he, uh, he went to more than 60 towns and villages. You know, that's a lot of, lot of uh, communities. Well, well, that is, and especially in those days. So, well, first of all, what did he travel in? He traveled in a horse-drawn carriage. Uh, it was a little bigger than the one uh, at uh, John Brown House, which has just one seat. Uh, this had uh, a forward-facing seat and a rear-facing seat. Uh, but, you know, to our sort of like if you're, you go to a, 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 the lift in a ski mountain, kind of like a gondola, you know, going up and down, not very big at all, uh, pulled by four horses. Uh, there was, you know, a driver up top. There were postillions that would sometimes ride the horses to help, you know, keep everything going. And, you know, he was traveling 40, 50 miles at the most a day, and he would have to stop. Uh, throughout the day to feed the horses and the people, uh, and, uh, and of course, to, to greet people as he went along. Uh, <laughs> a mundane kind of a question. Who paid for all of this? This was the government. You know, this was, you know, he, it's like uh, you know, today when the president uh, goes out to somewhere, it's, he travels in Air Force One, uh, but it's, it's, it's paid for uh, by, the, by the government. Washington makes, but sets some parameters. He, you know, he, this is all new. People are fearful that the first president of the United States is gonna end up being a, a monarch, uh, a dictator. And he wants to assure people that, you know, he is one of them. And so instead of staying at uh, rich people's houses, he insists on staying at uh, taver public taverns. And, you know, we think of a public tavern today a tavern, a historic tavern. We think of a B and B, you know, with waffles in the morning and something like that, you know, with plush beds. That wasn't the case back in the late 18th century. Uh, these were uh, flea-infested, horrible beds. The food worse, but Washington had a point to prove, uh, and uh, and so that's what he went about. Now, how big was his entourage, if you will? Well, not very big by our standards. Uh, a total of six people, uh, and you know, including uh, two aides. Uh, but most of the, the there were two enslaved uh, servants uh, manning the horses and and the baggage wagon. And uh, you know, this was they they'd come to a tavern and uh, you know take a couple. Of the 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 work the, the servants would end up usually up in the attic. Uh, Washington would get his own room, but it, you know, this was not uh, some like King George on what were, was known as a Royal Progress where hundreds of, of, of Royal uh, employ, you know, servants and, and whatever would follow the, the King. This was a pretty humble light traveling um, uh, uh, retinue. Did people in these towns know he was coming ahead of time? Yes, uh, there uh, usually yes. Uh, in the New England tour, it was publicized. He was, uh, you know, headed to New Haven. Uh, next uh, up would be Springfield, and then it would be Worcester. Ultimately, Cambridge and Boston. That kind of thing. And and huge and word of mouth passed it along. And there would be huge crowds uh, off at at the cro at crossroads in the towns, uh, eagerly awaiting him. But one one of the exceptions was uh, his return from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, yeah, he just had to get back. And so, and back to going, Washington. Yeah, Washington. He was going back to uh, the temporary capital of, of New York. And he oh, just yeah, had okay. to get back. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and so he, he, you know, hauled it as fast as he could. You know, he was going 40 miles a day, but he would off end up coming to communities that didn't realize he was coming and go, oh my goodness, is that George Washington? <laughs> and, you know, people would flood, you know, flood out to see him, uh, but he, he would surprise, you know, catch these communities unawares uh, in, in that section. But mo his whole point in this was to see as many people as possible, you know, if not close up to at least, he was make, proving a point. He was now the leader of this country, an elected president, and it wasn't just about their town, their state. It was about something bigger than that, the United States of America. And so, you know, by the end of this uh, New England tour, people were um, talking about, you know, how the arrival of the president unites all hearts uh, in his, you know, in his favor. And remember, the passage of the the, the 
the Constitution deeply divided America. Uh, you know, half the population distrusted the strong federal government that was created by it. They were, they were called anti-federalists, while those that were for the Constitution were federalists. And so there, you know, a, a political divide very similar in many ways to what we're experiencing today was true then. He had to sell this uh, to the anti-federalists. And, and what you read, for example, in the, in the Salem newspapers is, is former anti-federalists suddenly showing great enthusiasm to greet the president once he comes to town. You know, he was uh, not only pop, the most popular man in America, but perhaps the world. And so he used that star power to create, uh, to help try to create an office that was stronger than any individual. Would most people recognize him? I mean, this is obviously way before photography and everything else. Would people, unless they had, had they not been told ahead of time, and this fellow showed up in their town, would they have known just from his face who it was? Really good question. Usually they'd go, oh, that's got to be George Washington, because who else would be in this carriage? You know, they had heard he was in the vicinity, but no, there were times in the New England tour where uh, at night uh, his entourage would arrive uh, at, at a, a tavern, knock on the door, and ask if they could stay there. And in two inc incidents, two instances, uh, he was turned away. They didn't recognize him. One instance, they thought he was the president of Yale rather than the president of the United States. It said, get away, get away. I don't know what that says about the reputation of Yale at that time. But can you imagine? This is the president of the United States. He's um, being turned away at taverns and, and having to find something else. This was, it's a good thing there wasn't TripAdvisor. Because, um, uh, you know, it, uh, it, when you read his diary, and he kept a diary throughout, it's, you know, bed's awful, uh, food worse. <laughs> you, you can just imagine that would be a tough one to have on your, you know, your website. <laughs> what sorts of things might he do in these towns? I mean, would there be a, a, uh, oh, an auditorium or whatever to, for, he could give a speech in, or would he sometimes just, you know, pass right on through? Right. It depended on the size of the town. If it was a smaller town, uh, what he would often do is uh, uh, halt his carriage before he entered the town, step out of the carriage dressed in his general's uniform from the revolution. You know, and, and remember, Washington was a big man. He was six foot, two inches tall, maybe even six foot four, really tall for the 18th century. He'd get on this huge white horse named Prescott dressed in his uh, general's outfit and ride down Main Street uh, to tremendous applause. And, and, and so it was sort of the, the dramatic, here he is uh, kind of moment. You know, after eight years as commander of the Continental Army, he knew how to make an impression. Uh, often if it was a larger city, uh, there, he, he, written addresses would be presented to him from the Society of the Cincinnati, which were uh, veterans of the, of the Revolutionary War Society. And let's say the ministers would together write him, collectively write him an address. And he would then for, formally respond to them uh, also in writing. Uh, there, would, there would be dinners uh, where uh, there would be toasts. You know, this is, these were sort of the tweets <laughs> of their day where you know, a toast was a pithy you know, to General Washington and then the, the health of this country. And then there'd be, you know, people would drink a toast, a cannon would go off, and then there would be another toast. And so it was, it was very ceremonial. Um, it was, you know, sort of rallying a sense of national pride uh, in a country where, uh, you know, this was kind of a novel concept. Now, obviously, he wanted to make the country more united than it was. And that was the purpose of the trip. But is there any sense of whether or not he truly enjoyed doing this, or was this just something he felt he had to do? Combination of, of both, Charlie. Uh, he, he, for one thing, he loved getting out of the office. Uh, and in fact, when he started as president, he uh, came down with a series of illnesses that almost killed him in the early years of his presidency. You know, he was used to, uh, during the eight years of, of the revolution, he had been constantly on the move. Even um, uh, after that, at Mount Vernon, 
he was typically spend between four and six hours uh, on horseback and <laughs> inspecting his, his uh, plantation. So this was a guy who was used to being outside. Once he became president, he was chained to a desk. Uh, the stresses were enormous. I mean, he was not just president, he was inventing the office of the presidency. And he had these ser series of illnesses and he realized that the stresses of the office just might kill him. But to, to put that stress behind him, getting out on the road was for Washington relaxing. It was enjoyable. What, but there are aspects of this that he couldn't, didn't enjoy. You know, I mentioned the public taverns, you know, not the, you know, not the greatest beds and food. Um, and what he really hated was when the local militia uh, would, uh, uh, the cavalry would insist on leading his entourage, kicking up this cloud of dust that would, you know, choke him in the, in the carriage. And so uh, he, he, he would uh, develop a strategy where in the morning, it was usually assumed that he would be escorted out of a, a city or a town by the, the militia on their horses. And so he would say, well, I am leaving at 10 a.m., uh, be there sharp. He would then proceed to leave at 8 a.m. and avoid <laughs> the escort. And so, uh, you know, he, he made it work. Uh, you know, he, he, was, he was someone who really understood the power of ceremony and, uh, and how necessary it was at this beginning time of uh, our country's history. A moment ago, you touched on the, the roads. Tell us what the roads were like in those days. How bad were they? Right. I, if, uh, if a Nantucketer is familiar uh, uh, with, um, uh, what, what is it, that the uh, uh, Millbrook Road, you know, yes. it's... It's, it's just a mess, right? You know, it's, it's up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. When it rains, there's, there's water everywhere. I mean, they, these things were a mess when, uh, and Washington knew about this because when uh, he, he won the revolution with a 500 mile march from New York to Yorktown. And, you know, the, when it rained, the roads were so bad uh, that uh, passers by on horses and uh, pedestrians would often get off the road <laughs> and go on the edges because the roads became basically muddy ditches. Uh, and, and so they just were a mess. And so uh, one of the, the positives that came out of Washington's tour was after two years of touring the country, it be, uh, people realized how bad their roads were, that how difficult it had been for their president to make his way to their cities. And so that really inspired um, a, a, a beginning of, of you know, building roads that uh, would begin to resemble the kinds of things that were uh, available in Europe. And this also applied to um, hotels. There, you know, hotels did not exist. Um, there were just these roadside, these taverns. After Washington's tour, you begin to see the hotel industry throughout America beginning. Uh, because so many, particularly in the South, there weren't enough taverns for him to stay in. And um, so he would sometimes be forced to stay at people's houses just because there was no alternative. And so people began to realize we really need to have more accommodations. We need to have an infrastructure. Now, what infrastructure there was at that time, I'm assuming there were a lot of bridges, but a lot of rivers that he had to take a boat across? Yeah, uh, there was, uh, he almost uh, died twice. <laughs> uh, uh, one was uh, getting to Annapolis uh, from Rock Creek on the other side of Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they had a ferry, uh, a ferry kind of like ours. It was 30 miles, you know, to get there, a lot like the Nantucket oh. Ferry. And uh, he headed out. Uh, his entourage required uh, three different boats. And when they say a ferry, these are basically big sailboats. And they went out and they, uh, uh, at night, got caught in a terrible thunderstorm. And Washington's, the boat Washington was on, fetched up on a series of shoals at the um, mouth of the harbor in, at Annapolis. And the, it was being pounded to pieces. Luckily, he was saved in the morning, but it was a horrendous crossing. And then um, after, uh, Later in that southern tour, he had just left Mount Vernon, was you know, headed south and crossing the Okawan River. And, uh, and this was 
a more of a raft type ferry and they were going across it. And what often happened in these ferries, the horses would get spooked and attempt to jump off the ferry, which is what happened. And uh, the horses were attached, you know, the, there's four horses, they're attached to each other. And they almost ended up dragging the whole carriage uh, off the ferry. Luckily, they were, make, they were able to make it to shallow, shallow water. Uh, men jumped out and grabbed the horse uh, but it wasn't easy. It was, you know, this was real work for Washington. Well, this, this is obviously very tough stuff you're talking about. How old was he at this point? He was 57 uh, when he became president. And remember, Washington came from what he described as a short-lived family. He had already outlived uh, by many years any male in his family for generations back. You know, they all uh, expired in their, their 40s at the latest in their 50s. And so he really felt that he was already on borrowed time. And uh, this was grueling. Uh, he was, you know, given his, his eight years uh, in the revolution, this, he was someone who was used to traveling and, and all the rigors associated with it. And I think he kind of enjoyed that. Uh, what was really hard for him, as I said earlier, was being in the office all day. And, and so for him, it was kind of a relief, but a relief that when it, particularly when it came to the Southern tour that went on for three months and you can just see uh, by his comments in the diary, by the end of it, he's just itching to get the thing over with. Now, did he ever put, make that diary into a book? Yes, uh, it's been published uh, along with, um, you know, most of his presidential papers. And, uh, and so uh, Melissa and I, when we headed out to follow Washington, we had his diary. And Melissa had the diary in her lap. Uh, she was in the riding shotgun. And, um, you know, and so we'd go to a place and she would read what he would, had experienced and we would experience it in the 21st century. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fun, fun experience. Now I'm assuming that Martha Washington was not with him at all on these trips, or, or did she join him? Uh, you know, she had, during the revolution, uh, she made a point of always joining him at his winter quarters. In fact, it's been estimated that almost half Washington's time away uh, from Mount Vernon, and he was away the whole time, basically, in those eight years, she was with him. Uh, but when it came to these tours of, of um, America, she stayed at home. They had adopted uh, their their um, so their son had died uh, actually during the revolution, and his two youngest children uh, they adopted. Uh, uh, the youngest, uh, Washi uh, Washington, uh, was an infant when his father died. He was eight years old when Washington headed out, and his older sister was you know, three years older than he was, and so they were they were raising them. And so Martha needed to stay home with the kids. Um, and, and so uh, what's interesting are the letters she writes while Washington is away. She's not enjoying her, she, particularly in the early years of his presidency, she, she, both of them wanted to stay home at Mount Vernon and live out their lives and, you know, in, in relative solitude. But Washington realized that if I'm not president, really, there is no one who can can do it. And so um, off, off he, you know, so she, in her letter, she says, you know, I feel like a prisoner in my home. Uh, you know, this is, you know, I know if I was a younger person, many uh, women would enjoy this, the splendors associated with being president, but I don't. And, and so, um, but there's this wonderful comment I, I, from hers in a, a letter to one of her friends saying, you know, but I've long since learned that happiness is it's more dependent on your own disposition than your circumstances, you know? So she, she tried to have a brave face about it, but for both of them, this was something they were doing for the good of their country. This was not uh, something they wanted to do. I wanna turn from George to you. I wanna know how you experienced uh, retracing his steps, what you had to do, uh, have at it. Yeah, well, you know, this was one of those. Uh, this was a, a a a chance for me to to write a different kind of book, and uh, you know, so our journey 
would be uh, similar, would interweave with the narrative along with George's. And one of the first things I did before we departed was reach out to the historical societies and libraries in just about each and every of the towns Washington um, visited. So we're talking hundreds of towns. So this was a huge uh, logistical, uh, just in terms of research. And so I reached out by email, called people, uh, asked them what did they have about George Washington's visit? Because I didn't want this to just be George's point of view. I wanted to know how his visit was remembered in the various communities he visited. And so um, uh, uh, all of these, this information started flooding back to me even before we had headed out. Uh, diaries, Xeroxes from 19th century uh, local histories, all of this local local historical information, and um, it was it was great. It was kind of a throwback to how I got started writing history on Nantucket. You know, I was introduced to history locally. Um, I was an English major in college. I came, became fascinated with Nantucket's history and started researching it. And would go to the Nantucket Historical Association, the Athenaeum, the Town Building, you know, and hang out in the archives. And this was a chance for me to return to the you know, the local side of things. Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. Well, I'm here before you today to say all history is local. Even something, you know, as national in scope as a, a president's travels. And so what would happen is we got all this information and many um, archivists and, and librarians said, hey, if you, you're in our town, we'd love to give you a tour. And so we, you know, pull into a town like Holliston, Massachusetts, for example. Mm -hmm. And Joanne Hulbert, uh, the, the local historian, uh, you know, met us at the Historical Society uh, and then took us on a tour of the town. And we, you know, we follow, follow her car and convoy and we went to several different places Washington visited. And, uh, you know, it was just a great way to experience a town. And so for, for Melissa and me and, and Dora, uh, remember, we had to stay only in dog friendly hotels. So, um, you know, that was one of the challenges of our particular uh, version of following George. But it was it was for both of us. It was great, um, you know, but it was busy because we had all of these you know, interviews, people we had to meet. You know, it was we were almost as programmed as as the president had been when he came by 230 years before. Obviously, you were going much faster than he could, but how long did it take you? Well, you know, there were some times we wondered about that. If you follow Route 1 through New England, let me tell you, you know, God it's stop you. and go. <laughs> there was at one point, Melissa says, a man in a carriage would definitely be going faster than we are going, you know. <laughs> I, I and, believe that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, so for us, what we did was we divided the two major tours, New England and the South in half. Uh, just because, you know, we have two dads in their 90s on the Cape we had to keep track of, as well as, you know, children and grandchildren in Brooklyn. And so, um, and, and I had a book coming out in the middle of all this, you know, so it, we needed to break it up. And so, uh, you know, we, we would uh, do a week to 10 days at a time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that seemed about right, because to just do it continually would have been a, a real terminal case of burnout because, you know, I, we would start first thing in the morning, uh, uh, meet people all along the way, uh, get to our uh, motel room, uh, often around dinner time, have dinner. I'd spend that night uh, taking down my notes and then uh, go to bed and we'd start again in the morning. And so, um, you know, a, a week to 10 days at a time was good because again, would give me the time to sort of collect everything I had um, we pulled together uh, that way. And so, and when we went to the South, we really, because we had, we're traveling with Dora, we wanted to make sure we stayed, didn't get into the summer months. And so we, we did that in, in the spring, but it was, I would encourage anyone, if you, you get the book, um, and you have any interest in, in you know, doing a, a ramble across this country with a historical uh, theme, uh, you, if you go to the acknowledgments where I've listed every town we visited and, and the people who helped us along the way, you can really see um, you know, the, how we progress. And there are also great maps um, in the book 
that will show you, you know, where we went. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Well, the roads you drove on were obviously paved, but I'm wondering if they followed the same path as the dirt roads. In other words, were you actually on some of the roads Washington was actually on? Well, um, yes, and yes and no. Uh, what there is, when it came to his, his uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, uh, the, it's a great challenge to, you know, often Route 1 is similar to what the, you know, the, the King's Highway, you know, had been back then, but not always. And there was one um, helping us in the middle Atlantic states was uh, there is uh, the, the, the um, it, it's, it's the Washington Rochambeau, uh, they, they have, they have, uh, they have, this is an organization, it's, it's referred to in the book, in which they have used uh, the maps left by the French when they marched from New York to Yorktown. Uh, very detailed maps that show exactly where they went. And they have, they have gone through and on, on today's roads, shown you how to follow that. It's very detailed. And uh, so we had that advantage. Down south, um, a particular, you know, it was remote when Washington did it. In some areas, it's still pretty remote today. When we were uh, going from Georgetown, South Carolina to Charleston, uh, there is the old Charleston Road, uh, which is exactly where Washington went. It's no longer, it's still a road, but it's not the main thoroughfare it had once been. And so we had this wonderful uh, time where we're, we're going for 15, 20 miles through the pine forests uh, on this sandy dirt road, uh, seeing pretty much what Washington would have seen. And, uh, you know, so down south, particularly, you, you had those options on Long Island. He did a, a tour of Western Long Island. And uh, there are places even there where you can you know, find where uh, the old road uh, uh, diverged from what is now used. And, and it's kind of cool. You, you sort of get a cosmic sense of the past uh, right there in the middle of the 21st century. What about the the structures he was in, whether he was spending the night there or speaking there? How many of those are still around? Well, as we all know, the, the plaque, Washington slept here, <laughs> is almost omnipresent in this country. And um, uh, there are a lot of those that are still there. You know, and I, I always thought of those as kind of historical jokes. Ha ah, ha ha, Washington was sleeping around. But after this experience, Melissa and I realized, you know, this is no joke. This guy was, you know, he's president of the United States. When everybody else is on vacation, he is out there going from town to town to town, you know, uh, uh, you know, letting people know about the presidency in their country. And so there were, there was in, in um, so two instances, we uh, were able to uh, see the beds in which he had slept uh, when he was in that town, which is kind of cool. Really? And uh, yeah, one, there's one um, in, in, in New England and, uh, and then one down South, you know, so that's, that was really cool. Uh, and so, for example, Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, there is at the Fairfield uh, Historical Society, there's the Sun Tavern, which had just been newly built when Washington came through and was clearly where he had stayed. And um, you, we got a tour of that. Um, the same goes for Rye, New York. Uh, that was where Washington, when he departed from for his New England tour from the temporary capital of New York, that was his first stop. And that is now owned uh, by the Rye Historical Soci Society and uh, it's dog friendly. And so they uh, let Dora tour it with us, which was, which was a lot of fun. And so, yeah, you, 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 there's, uh, in Hampton, uh, Hampton Plantation in South Carolina, where Washington visited, it's now uh, you know owned by the state, and uh, there it is, you know, pretty much just the way it was when Washington visited. Now, as you've said, he was on this tour for a particular reason. He was stopping at particular places for particular reasons, but with. Well, not his hindsight, obviously, but with your observations of where he went, seeing through 21st century eyes, um, did, did any of the, his stops not make sense to you? Did you ever ask yourself, why was he in this place and, or not in that place? 
Yeah, well, you know, that um, uh, there was, for example, in the New England tour, he, he made a point of going to Marblehead, even though it was out of his way um, on his to go to Salem. And that was because he owed that town a huge debt. Um, uh, what he was rowed across uh, the Delaware by uh, sailors from Marblehead. Uh, they, you know, they, he really, they, they, every time he was in a tight spot, they, those, those were the soldiers who, who bailed him out. And Marblehead was in terrible economic straits in the years after the revolution. So he made a point of going out there and thanking them. Um, one of the strangest uh, legs of his tour that is, you know, kind of hard to figure out is uh, why he toured Western Long Island. You know, it, it was just, he headed out just for four days, but the reason, uh, it seems clear, and it's strange because it's the only one of his presidential tours in which there's absolutely no newspaper coverage. You know, it was, it was, it was uh, complete silence out there. You know, what was he doing? You know, he, because otherwise he wanted as much, he wanted this broadcast as far and wide as possible. Well, uh, during the revolution, uh, there had been a spy network, the Culper Spy Ring, based in Western Long Island uh, and Central Long Island uh, uh, in the town of Setauket on the northern shore of Long Island. That had been the nerve center of the Culper Spy Ring, as it is known today. Now, when Washington was doing this tour, the identity of those spies was not known to anyone except for uh, Washington and the officer who had been a spy chief. Not even the families of the spies knew that you know their their family members had been spies because the big danger was if this uh, experiment in republicanism should fail and the British come back to power, you don't want it to be known that you had been a spy um, during that unsuccessful revolution. And so, but Washington clearly wanted to thank them in some way. And so when you begin to see that as the organizing principle, you see everywhere he went was where, you know, uh, someone associated with the Culper spy ring had lived or had, had used to live. And so, for example, in Setauket, uh, the tavern owner who would make his way into British occupied New York on a regular basis, collect his provisions and also the message uh, from uh, the person posing as a loyalist who was uh, sending him secret messages. He'd take those, uh, make the 50 mile journey to Setauket. A signal would go up, uh, a, a whale boat would, and under the, the darkness of night would make its way from Fairfield across Long Island, pick up the message and take it back to Washington headquartered on the Hudson. And so Washington visit, you know, Went, went about to these places and, and Setauket, that, that tavern keeper, according to tradition, was so excited to have the president there that he fell off his horse and broke his leg. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then in Oyster Bay, um, uh, that was where these, the, the person who po posed as the loyalist, you know, the true um, center person was from. And so why, you know, this is fascinating stuff that you know, is. did Washington give them something money? Did he ever say anything? Maybe this was just all sorts of, you know, having the president show up, those who, who want to know, know. And so uh, that was for, uh, for uh, that was one of our favorite parts of, of this tour across America was, was to go, go to Long Island. And, and if you go to Setauket uh, today, uh, with uh, the the series Turn, which was so big, and, and you know, and uh, several books about it, they now have uh, spy tours, and, and you know, it's big business, historical business in Setauket. And so this was fun to you know to follow Washington, so after the fact, um, making his way, and it was in Oyster Bay. Uh, there's someone I know who actually I saw him for the first time in years at uh, our first uh, reading, uh, reading a marathon read of Moby Dick uh, at the Nantucket Athenaeum. Remember that many years oh, yeah. ago? Yeah. Uh, Phil Roosevelt, uh, you know, he's, he's one of those Roosevelt's, you know, Teddy Roosevelt. He, uh, he is a managing editor at Barron's Magazine. And he decided he wanted to do a story about 
the 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 uh, the, the uh, marathon read on Nantucket. So he came out and, you know, I, I, I attended it and he came up to me and said, Hey, remember me? I'm Phil Roosevelt. He had gone to college with my brother. And, um, and so it was great to get to know him. Well, it turned out Phil grew up in the house Washington slept in when he was in Oyster Bay. Oh my God. And, um, you know, and this is, this happened all the time during this tour where we'd get these like cosmic connections that we had no idea resulted. Mm -hmm. And so Phil would say um, there, there's a plaque, uh, you know, outside their house that, that the state put up years ago. And he said when he was a kid um, and his father was big into history, they had a portrait of George Washington over the mantle, but over time, the room Washington had slept in had been turned into a bathroom. And uh, Phil was, you know, about 10, 12 years old, you know, the time when bathroom humor is just hilarious. Um, and sometimes people would knock on the door and say, could we have a tour of the home? And every now and then he would, being a smart alecky kid, would say, yeah, sure, come on. And so give them a tour <laughs> and then finally come to the bathroom and say, Washington slept here. And so <laughs> these are the kinds of anecdotes that were really fun uh to 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 discover and and live in a way as we were following washington i've got to ask is it still a bathroom it's still a bathroom as far still as phil knows. yeah and you know phil phil's family no longer owns it um you know but it's <laughs> you know it's it's just uh, these are the kinds of things that just uh, down the street from there uh, in Oyster Bay, uh, there was a girl, uh, eight years old, named Sarah, who was standing at the gate of her house in 1790 uh, when Washington came by. And she, uh, when she was in her 90s, living in Greenwich Village, would speak to a, uh, a reporter and tell of the time Washington came, came to Oyster Bay and how uh, she was standing there and saw him ride by on his horse and across the street, they were building a one-room schoolhouse that would be there for more than 100 years. And Washington got off his horse, uh, walked over to the construction site, um, and volunteered to help the workmen put one of the rafters in place. Hmm. And, uh, and she would recount this. And so these were the kinds of stories. This was not the George Washington in the history books. You know, this oh. is not George Washington the president, the, the general, the, the plantation owner. This is Washington, the traveler, you know? And so we, we really began to feel a kinship with him. You know, the kinds of random things that happen when you're on the road. Well, it makes him more human to know that yes. he's doing something like that, not just sitting you know, as president for eight years. Right, right. And I think this is one of the reasons why he enjoyed going out on the road. He, you know, he could, he could escape himself in the official role as president, if just for a while and um, enjoy, you know, because there, between each stop, you know, he was out there on the road, often all, you know, their entourage all by themselves. There's, there's one uh, kid in North Carolina. He was sent uh, uh, as part of the militia that was to escort him, um, you know, to his first stop in North Carolina. And they went to the South Carolina border and found and were waiting and up comes uh, his coach, and they they stop and 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 it, uh, his aide was in the coach, and the aide says, "Oh, Washington's behind us somewhere on his white horse Prescott, ex getting some exercise. You know, go see if you can find it." And so these young men, uh, you know, ride out looking for Washington, and they up ahead they see him on this you know a, a hill, a high hill, on Prescott, you know, coming down all by himself. And, you know, and it was this vision that this 18-year-old uh, kid would record and never forget. Um, you know, and once again, this is Washington kicking back, have, you know, all by himself on his horse you know, in the middle of you know, backwoods, South Carolina, uh, enjoying himself. You know, it's a side of uh, statesman you don't get to see very often today, if at all. Right. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, today there's a, there's a camera following everyone you know, uh, and, and not always an official camera. And, uh, you know, Washington had the, the great luxury, looking back, of, of being able to, to, you know, have, if not anonymity, you know, some privacy 
um, uh, during this, these journeys. And, uh, you know, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why he wanted to stay in taverns. You know, he wasn't in somebody's house having to be, you know, the guest of, of someone. He could just go there uh, with his, you know, the, the people in his entourage and just be himself, at least for the night. And once he had gone to all the places he wanted to go to, he just stayed in the capital and, and that was it. He uh, finished out his years as president. Right. He, you know, by year two of his presidency, he had, you know, finished his tour. You know, and the great, you know, kind of tragic irony is that Washington, uh, by this tour, was trying to unite this country. But even Washington uh, could not stem um, the partisanship you know, we're experiencing today. Uh, while he was uh, uh, trying, on his, the end of his Southern tour, his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who uh, uh, did not agree uh, with the policy, the emerging policies of Washington's administration, particularly when it came to Alexander Hamilton's financial uh, plan, which involved uh, a taxation, a federal taxation plan, and a, a tax on whiskey and all that. They, the two really despised one another, uh, even though they were on the same cabinet. Uh, Jefferson and his cohort from uh, Virginia, uh, James Madison, while Washington is out there on a Southern tour, go on their own tour, Northern tour to the new state of Vermont. And he tells Washington he's doing it to get some exercise and get away from the pressures of office. But as quickly becomes apparent, he's using it to begin to organize what will become the political resistance, the anti-federalists into what will become the Republican Party, not the Republican Party we have today. And, and, you know, and within that next year, uh, he and Hamilton were in open warfare within his cabinet. Uh, the partisanship uh, that had been held in, at bay for the first two years had exploded. Washington wanted to quit after one term as president, but both sides said, if you don't, we're going to tear this, you know, the part the, the, the Federalist, anti-Federalist divide is going to tear this country apart. You need to stay there. Washington reluctantly decided to, okay, but as soon as he, you know, was elected to a second term, the anti-Federalists took over the Congress. And his, his second term was just uh, the most miserable experience one could imagine. And he was very bitter uh, by the time uh, he, he finally retired from office. And so Washington succeeded in creating a country built to last, a government built to last, but not even Washington could stem the kind of division we're experiencing today. And four years after he left office, the president was Thomas Jefferson. Exactly. And Thomas Jefferson would be a two, another two-term president. He would be followed by James Madison, his acolyte, who would then be followed by his acolyte, James Monroe, creating, in effect, a Jeffersonian uh, uh, you know, dynasty. And so, uh, you know, but on the other side of that is... Monroe was one of the worst partisans of all of them. Um, uh, he, he um, you know, did everything he could to undercut Washington. He briefly served as Washington's minister to France, uh, uh, issued this polemic condemning Washington. Uh, you know, well, I'm not on his dying breath, but pretty darn close to it. Washington is just saying how he despises Monroe, who gets is elected uh, governor just as he's, he's dying. And then, but when Monroe becomes president, the, uh, it's the other side of the War of 1812. Uh, the Federalist Party has given up the ghost. You know, it, it's, it's expired. And leaving uh, the Re Democratic Republicans is what they now call themselves, you know, the party. And what does uh, Mon Monroe, the, the most partisan of partisans do? He says, well, now I am now the president, not of a party, but of the nation. And, and, and you know, the, the, the White House is being repaired because it was burned by the British during the, the War of 1812. Congress goes into recess and he sets out on a tour of the country. <laughs> Thank you, George Washington. 
He, he even co-op, he even dresses in a military uniform because he briefly served in the revolution. Uh, when it comes to Boston, he realizes he needs a horse to ride into town. He secures one, get this, at a circus. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And um, Don't tell and, me it was a white horse. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I don't know what color it was, but he was, you know, he, he, you know, if, if flat, if, if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, uh, Washington had won over his harshest critic uh, 30 years after the end of his administration. And, uh, you know, so perhaps there's some hope for us yet. Maybe this political, you know, this rancorous political divide will burn itself at some, burn itself out at some point and allow us to come to a, you know, hopefully a, a more reasoned state of mind, but, you know, we'll just have to see. One final question, and not to do with Washington. Uh, what are you working on now? Well, you know, I, um, I'm turning to the California gold rush. Really? Yeah. You know, it's a story I first latched on to writing away offshore, you know, about the history of Nantucket, where, um, with the discovery of gold is just a few years after the great fire of 1846. Uh, the island of Nantucket was, was nearly evacuated of able-bodied men as they rushed out to the gold fields, you know, crowding into the, the, the whalers, uh, um, sailing around the horn and abandoning the, abandoning the ships at the Golden Gate. And so it's been something I've, I've always wanted to do. I, um, I, you know, one of my books, you referred to it, the introduction is, is uh, The Last Stand about the Battle of Little Bighorn. I loved writing that book, being out in the West for four years, researching it. And so I, I miss it. So this is gonna be a way to get back out West. Um, it's, you know, you, they traveled by land, uh, but they also traveled by sea. They also traveled by a steamship to the Isthmus. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it, a, a different kind of book. And, um, uh, and that's my next project. Well, that sounds great. But in the meantime, thank you for doing this show. This has been more than interesting. I was delighted to have you on. I'm looking forward to reading the book and I appreciate your taking the time to come on. Oh, well, Charlie, it's always great to talk to you. And, uh, and thank you for, for doing what you're doing with, NC, with the TV station, because this is, this is great for all of us. Well, thank you very much. It's certainly fun for me too. For Profiles on Nantucket Community Television, Channel 18, I'm Charlie Walters. Thank you for tuning in. Please tune in again.